Hello, hello everyone and welcome back. Today's video is going to be kind of broken up into two different parts. The first part is going to be about the flowers I'm growing for the vegetable garden and the landscape to attract beneficial insects and hopefully repel some pests. And then the second part of the video is how I planned my cut flower garden. So I will put a timestamp up on the screen in case you're just interested in the details on how I planned my cut flower garden. Although I would love if you enjoyed the entire video. That way YouTube doesn't think my video just stinks. Um, but I understand if you're just interested in one and not the other. Now a few of you have asked for a video on how I planned my cut flower garden. So I'm super excited to finally have this done for you guys. But I will say that this video is about how I planned the actual flowers that are going to be in the bed, where they're gonna be located, how many of each variety I'm gonna grow, the spacing and things like that. But I will have videos coming out shortly, hopefully talking about how we built this no dig, no till cut flower garden, and then how I chose the actual flowers that I chose. So for example, I chose things that had more than one benefit to them. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get on into this video. I am so excited, you guys. I just got my cell trays. I had to order some bigger ones. I just could not put up with those 128 and 200 cell trays. I'm getting really behind on my seed starting because I'm spending so much time transplanting and transplanting and potting up and potting up instead of sowing more seeds because they're running out of space so quickly. So I'm out of breath because I'm I've been running around like trying to get everything done today. But yeah, so I ordered some 50 cell and some 70 cell trays so that these can stay in there until they are ready to go outside instead of everything running out of room. I would rather buy more cell trays and more grow lights and then take up a little bit more room. I thought that with me starting the cut flower garden this year that I just wouldn't have the space for everything. But it turns out the way I'm succession sewing, I'm not you know, needing as much room as I thought. So I should actually be fine with the grow lights I have because before the next round needs started, the last round is about ready to go out. So I shouldn't need any more grow lights, but if I do, I would just much rather buy more grow lights. I was worried these 72 cells wouldn't be big enough because the 72 cell like jiffy trays, those are actually pretty small, but because these are square instead of like hexagon shaped, uh, they look like they are going to be plenty big. I'll show you the 72 cells just for a quick comparison. I have a bunch of... My son carried one out for me. He put it way over here. Just for a comparison, I will show you. I have these out here hardening off because they're about ready to go out. These are my Lysianthus and some lavender that I didn't have the best germination with, but it says those can take up to three months to germinate. So... But just for a quick comparison, you can see how much smaller those are. So what I will probably do is start all of my tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and squash and all those sort of things in these because those are started just a few weeks before my last frost date, but they grow really quickly. So that will give them plenty of room. And then all of the flowers and herbs and everything else will get planted in the 72 cells. I'm so excited, guys. I'm almost at six weeks before my last frost, so there's going to be tons and tons of seeds starting this week, and I mean like hundreds of things being started this week. I'm so excited. All right, so next up, we have all of the things that are going to go in my vegetable garden for repelling pests and a few things that is going to go in the landscape. So we have sweet peas, marigolds, zinnias, nasturtiums, milkweed, and yarrow. So the yarrow, oh, and frosted explosion grass and mahogany slender hibiscus. I thought those would be nice to tuck in in the landscape as well as, you know, those will also go in the cut flower garden. But for now, I'm just planting the ones that are going to go in the landscape. And then the yarrow is also going to be for the cut flower garden, but I'm just starting some right now for the landscape. I want to plant lots of milkweed for the monarchs and all the other butterflies. And then nasturtiums for uh, the vegetable gardens. I'll pop a picture up. That's a really pretty var variegated leaf nasturtium. And then I've got some dwarf zinnias. And then I have three colors of marigold for repelling pests. 
And then I thought these would be nice to throw in the landscape. These are a dwarf sweet pea. I bought these a while ago, so I don't know if they'll be even any good. So I'll probably sew these pretty heavily. And we're going to be using the new 72 cells. I've got a tray of dirt over here. I've already got the peat moss, cocoa coir, and perlite. I just have to add in some vermiculite. I've probably said it, I don't know how many times in this video already, but I'm, 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 I'm being honest. I'm so, so excited. I'm so excited for the cut flower garden. I'm so excited to be building bouquets and playing around with making arrangements. I've spent so much time doing research and planning and I just, I'm, I'm having faith that it's going to be a very successful year. I'm having faith that I picked really good flowers for cutting and I'm having faith that we did a good job, you know, building the no dig, that's uh, no dig flower garden. We have just started on our raised bed, uh, raised beds for the vegetable garden. So it's just, it's all coming together and I'm just, I just can't wait to be harvesting flowers and vegetables. So the first one I'm going to start out with is the Eskimo Marigold, which is a really pretty creamy yellow. It says creamy white, but it looks like a really, really light yellow in the picture. Since these are larger seeds, I used a lot of vermiculite and perlite. I know that I mentioned in the last couple videos that if it's a small seed like a snapdragon, then I will usually forgo the vermiculite and the perlite, at least on the top. Sometimes I fill up the bottom half with vermiculite and perlite, and then just the top half with peat moss and cocoa coir. But since these are larger seeds, it's fun for me to use the perlite and the vermiculite because it's not like it's a little tiny seed that's gonna struggle to, you know, poke its way up through. And these are brand new seeds, and I usually don't plant multiple seeds per cell, especially when they're new, just because for one, I'm cheap, <laughs> and I feel like that's wasteful. And for two, whenever they all come up, then I wanna try to find a spot for them but it really is nicer when you have this full, beautiful full tray of flowers instead of a lot of the you know spots being blank and then you have to reseed and then some of them are different sizes and you wanna to try to get air to some of them and then you know the rest still need that humidity and that moisture. So for these, given that they're so inexpensive, I'm just gonna go ahead and seed two per cell and I'll just cut away the extra. The next one is gonna be petite yellow. This is like the uh, type of marigold that you'll usually find in your local garden centers or local nurseries. If I can get them out. Last year I grew a lot of a marigold variety called Mission Giant Yellow and it was a yellow marigold just like this one but it gets it says two to three feet. Mine got around four feet if not taller and it produced so many blooms and I saved a ton of seeds and I'm going to use a lot of them for my little wildflower patch that I plan to put in the, I plan to do two of them. I plan to put one in the front yard and one behind my barn, but I really want these shorter varieties for the vegetable garden. Uh, that way I can kind of underplant them, underplant my tomatoes and my peppers and cucumbers and things like that. The next one is an orange called petite orange. Same thing, this is just like your typical marigold that you would find at your local garden center. Hopefully these help to repel aphids if I plant a lot of them. I planted a few, I mean, I planted quite a few last year, but for the size of my vegetable garden, it wasn't enough, I don't think. I mean, I didn't have a really bad problem with aphids at all. Like, I mean, at all. Like it was a really good year actually, knock on wood. Uh, but I don't know if it was because it's a new area that haven't hadn't found that there were, you know, flowers and things there yet or what, but it wasn't too bad and I, I didn't spray but maybe twice um, I use neem oil or insecticidal soap but I didn't even have to use either of those but maybe twice because I only had like I never saw a flower with more than like maybe 15 or 20 and when you have such a mature plant you know 15 or 20 aphids are, are not gonna do any real damage and it's just not worth it to me to spray and take the chance of hurting anything, you know, any beneficial insects. Since I stopped spraying inorganic sprays and 
try to stop, you know, try to not spray neem oil or insecticidal soap unless it's absolutely necessary. I have found such a huge increase in beneficial bugs. Just so many, so many predator bugs like ladybugs and things like that. It really is an amazing thing to, you know, to walk out to your garden and see, you know, all these aphids and things. And then, you know, the next day to find that Mother Nature has taken care of it. Covered these up with some vermiculite. Now it is time to plant the zinnias. I got a lot of varieties of zinnias this year from Swallowtail and Johnny's. But I wanted to just get some inexpensive zinnias uh, just for the landscape. So I just picked these up at the Dollar Tree for a quarter, which, I mean, you can't beat that. These only get, well, they get a pretty decent height. It says 18 to 24 inches, and in my experience, they always get taller than that. Like all of the uh, zinnias that I've grown that say that they get about three to four feet usually get five or six. So now I'm going to plant the rest of this tray up with the zinnias and then move on to another tray for the nasturtiums. You know, my main goal with this video, the last couple videos, has really been to just uh, show you guys what I'm planting and when. Uh, I know that whenever I was doing research for, you know, the cut flower garden, there wasn't a whole lot of videos that really told you, like, you know, you should plant this this week and then this this week. And that has been, you know, my goal for these videos, to try to give you guys an idea of, you know, first I did the, the lisianthus, then the ranunculus, then this, then this. I just wanted to show you quickly um, a little bit of my plans and... Maybe this will help you. This is the annual cut flower garden. And then this is my perennial cut flower garden. I typed up all of the varieties of everything that I'm growing. I did fillers separately. I did foliage separately. And then I did each type of flower. So like amaranth, bachelor buttons, snapdragons, zinnias. And I typed out all of the varieties. And then I also typed up how many seeds were in each packet. And then I went back with a pencil, as you can see. And I just wrote down the recommended spacing, how many weeks before my last frost to plant them. I put, is it a cut and come again? Is it like a medium producer? Is it something that only produces once? Um, does it need support or netting? Is it, you know, is it a single stem, like a single stem sunflower or does it have multiple flowers? Um, does it need to be direct sowed or as soon as the soil could be worked? Um, and then I just added in notes, like Florette has a lot of good notes, like how many times they sow something a year. Like for amaranth, they do three to four batches and they do them two to three weeks apart. Like that was one of the hardest things for me because, you know, um, some, some flower farmers, you know, they need their flowers like to be producing at the top of their game, you know, constantly. So they may need three to four batches, two to three weeks apart, but I may be able to let that amaranth continue to produce for a couple months. So that was one of the hardest things for me to decide on, like, you know, like zinnias um, every three weeks. Now, my zinnias produce all summer. They may slow down a little bit, but not really enough that I notice. So I'm not going to sow those every three weeks. <laughs> but every three weeks, no. <laughs> so, you know, that's something I'm actually still kind of trying to determine. Like, say for the pincushion, I'm planning to plant 12 of them. I don't know, am I going to plant three every week for, you know, a month? Or am I going to plant three and then wait a couple weeks, do another three, wait a couple weeks, do another three? Because not only do I need to think about how often... But if I wait, you know, if I plant them every three weeks, then these aren't going to be planted until, you know, the beginning of June. And these may cast a shadow on these seedlings by then. So, you know, this year is really just going to be, you know, a big learning year for me. Learning, you know, is this spacing that I'm choosing uh, going to work for me like it does other people? You know, how often should I succession sow certain things and things like that. But I think I got a really good plan going so far. And then... Like I said, I, I typed everything up there and then I also made a spreadsheet. Uh, I separated the flowers by large flowers, medium flowers, small filler flowers, spikes, foliage fillers, and then draping flowers, which I'm not doing a lot of because I'm not doing a lot of arrangements. It's mainly going to be like market style bouquets. And this is like my fifth copy of this. Um, I've reprinted new ones because I kept, you know, having to add things to it and uh, things like that. But like I wanted to make sure that I didn't have all focal flowers because you really want to have a pretty equal amount of things. You don't want all focal flowers and just 
say one filler flower because then you're going to be using that same filler flower for every bouquet and you know you just want you want to try to have a pretty good a pretty good mixture of things this isn't exactly like a good visual of like how many focal flowers compared to how many of these because I'm not necessarily planting just one of each of all of these. So don't look at this and say, well, you have a lot more of these. You don't have many of these because I may be only planting a couple plants of each of these varieties of sunflowers and zinnias and a lot more of the bachelor buttons or sweet peas or love in a mist. That was another thing that was pretty time consuming because, you know, I have more varieties of the large and medium flowers. So I have to make sure that I'm planting enough of these small filler flowers and my foliage to, to make sure I have a pretty equal recipe, which is why I wanted to draw everything out. Like I started out doing one bed of, I think it was filler and small flowers, and then medium and large flowers, and then spikes and draping flowers. And then I just kept increasing, you know, or taking away certain things until I had a pretty equal ratio. Because I also, this is just my annuals. This isn't including my bulbs um, or my tubers or things like that either. And then the next thing I did, well, this isn't exactly in order. This is just something else I did. I printed out, I started out with six, uh, six by three beds just so that I had something to give me an idea of, you know, how many will fit in about this much space. but my beds are 40 foot long by three foot wide. I printed grid paper, but then I drew the lines in for four inch spacing, six inch spacing, nine inch, 12 inch, and 18 inch. And then I took a ruler and drew out the lines so that I could figure out exactly how many would fit in a bed that size. So, you know, six inch, that's pretty easy to figure out, but it can, you know, get a little bit difficult when you're going into things like nine inches. It's hard to explain, like, you know, with a six inch, with a six inch spacing, you know, you start six inches away from the edge and you go every six inches. But on a nine inch spacing, if you go, you know, nine inches from the side of the bed, then you're going to end up with three rows. So there's not an going to be an equal distance. I hope that makes sense the way I explained it. And yes, I've spilled coffee and everything else on these papers. Um, but anyways, so that's what I did. And then I wrote down everything that takes that spacing. So I know that for asters, I can fit 32 plants in a bed this size. And then that's the guide that I used when planting or when planning this out. So if a three foot wide bed fits four rows, then if I do baby's breath, which is a nine inch spacing, then for a two foot by three foot section, that gives me 12 plants. If I do the six inch spacing, like the uh, cut flower kale, that gives me 12 plants for a one foot by three foot section. If I do straw flowers, I have three plants for every one foot by three foot section. And I just want to say you definitely do not have to do all of these things that I'm doing to plant a cut flower garden. You can just go out there and just plant some seeds. Like it does not by no means have to be this, this time consuming. You don't have to do, you know, all of this that I'm doing. Um, but the reason I did this is because I wanted to grow as many different things as I could in as small of a space as possible. So that's why I played around with so many different, you know, spacings and different amounts of this and, you know, putting in more of these and taking away a few of those. That way I can have 
lots of different varieties, but not take up my entire yard. And, um, you know, that way I can grow a lot of different things and see what works well in my area and things like that. Because growing cut flowers just, you know, just for the intention of growing them and cutting them and selling them is new to me. So I want to try to grow as many different things as I can and also have a lot of different things to use in bouquets instead of kind of the same things over and over. And I forgot to mention, um, after I went through and separated everything by, you know, flower size, flower type, I separated them by spring, summer colors, and then like fall colors. So I don't want to be planting all of my, you know, orange and red sunflowers and orange and red zinnias in the spring and the summer. I just, I didn't want to plant, you know, too many oranges and reds and yellows in the spring and then not really be able to sell them. Um, I just feel like most people are going to go for the pinks and the reds and the colors like that more in the spring and summer. So I separated them by color scheme and decided what colors I'm going to plant in, you know, in the beginning of the year and then what I'm going to plant more towards midsummer. And then once I had like all of the spacing figured out and, you know, how many weeks before my last frost I needed to plant everything, how many of each plant I was going to plant and all of those things. Then I went through and I took a post-it note and I wrote down like weeks 10 and 11. I gave myself a two week span of between this week and this week, I need to plant all of these things. And then the same for the other weeks. So, you know, five to six weeks before my last frost, I have a, you know, a list for that. So that's pretty much how I planned my cut flower garden. But one more thing I wanted to elaborate on. Earlier in the video, I said that for the varieties I chose, I tried to choose things that had multiple benefits. So what I meant by that was, uh, for example, instead of choosing just randomly flowers that I think are pretty, I tried to choose things that had multiple benefits. Um, whether that was that they were cut and come again, uh, that they don't need to be staked, things that uh, could be used for more than one type of thing, like something that can be used as a filler flower or a foliage. So, for example, cosmos. Early in the spring, when it has not yet bloomed, you can use just the leaves as a filler or as a foliage. And then later in the summer, when it begins to bloom, then you can obviously use those flowers. So they have multiple benefits. Same with basil. You can use their foliage as a foliage in your bouquet. And then once it gets too hot and they go to flower, you can also still use that as a filler. So I tried to choose things like that, that had multiple benefits. Now, if you're interested in me doing a video just on like every uh, variety that I chose and more details about it, like, is it a cut and come again? Does it produce only once? Like stock, for example, it only sends up one flower and then you cut it and then it's done. And then there are some things that are kind of in the middle. They may send up a few stems, like say Bells of Ireland, uh, it will send off a few shoots, but it's, you know, not a cut and come again, like, you know, zinnias, bachelor buttons, and cosmos. So if you'd like me to work on a video going over all of the varieties and a lot of their benefits, whether they're cut and come again, whether they need staked, things like that, then let me know in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Uh, because I feel like something like this would have been really beneficial uh, whenever I was planting my cut flower garden. Uh, I couldn't really find, you know, one place that had all of this information. But I will say that I did choose Johnny's for most of my seeds this year because they do include a whole lot of information. All right, guys, well, I know this kind of went from <laughs> planting seeds to how I planned my cut flower garden, but I have had a lot of questions about it. So hopefully it helped you get an idea of how I planned it and maybe how you can plan yours if you're interested in planting a cut flower garden. But that's going to be it for this video. I will talk to you in the next one.